how to start a speech. First way, with a question that matters to the audience. How do you phrase a problem that the audience faces in a question? So that would be the third best way of starting a speech. The second best way of starting a speech is with a factoid that shocks. There's more people alive today than have ever died. There's more people alive today than have ever died. So there's a lot of speeches that can follow on from there. Babe with wild wolves all around it. So a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. I saw a black branch with blood that kept dripping. I saw a babe that was just bleeding. I saw a babe that I'm sorry. Earth. So I'll tin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could we start that section? I apologize. Sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> A newborn babe with wild wolves all around it. So a highway of diamonds with nobody.
in order to distill and understand what makes a good speaker good, what makes a great speaker great, and what makes an outstanding speaker outstanding. The result? 110 core skills with loads of sub-skills. So what does it look like? It looks like this. These are the 110 core skills, and the equation is simple. The more of them you fulfill, the greater you are. Now, 110 skills, that's quite a tad too many to go through in one TED talk, don't you agree? So what I've done is I've picked out my absolute favorites, and I'd like to show you a demonstration of what it can look like. Imagine that this chair is something that you want somebody else to believe in. You want somebody else to buy into this. This is your idea. This is you wanting to make your voice heard. This gives you two options. Either you're on this side of the chair and you're a fairly mediocre communicator, you shoot from the hip, you hope for the best, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Option number two is that you're on this side of the chair and you know exactly what you're doing in every instance of time. You know that by taking a step forward, you increase focus. You know that by tilting your head slightly to the side, you increase empathy. You know that by changing the pace of what you are saying, you increase focus. And you know that by shifting yourself lower, you increase trust. And you know that by lowering your voice, you get anticipation. And you know for absolute certain that if you pause, you get absolute and undivided attention. Now the question then is, can everyone be on this side of the chair? Can everyone become good at these skills? What do you think the answer is? Of course it is. Why? Because it's called presentation skills, 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 skills. It is not, has never been, and shall never be called a talent. You're not born with a particular gene that makes you brilliant on stage. <laughs> and do you know what's even more intellectually challenging for me to understand? is how can a person sit over here in this meeting room with 10 others observing this dismally bad PowerPoint filled with charts, graphical elements, page numbers, fading away five, seven minutes, thinking of other things, you know, the feeling, the boredom, the waste of time. This person, after 40 minutes, he or she will stand up, be dazed, you know, trotting off to his own office coming into his own computer, flipping it up, going like, oh my god, I've got a presentation tomorrow, and I do have a PowerPoint to build. Now, what is the chance that this person will build an equally bad PowerPoint as the one that he or she was by herself tortured by in the other conference room? Is that a big chance? Yeah. Now, what is that? Is that, why do we do that? Is that vengeance? Is that where you go like, you did that to me? I'm going to do it to you. you got it coming, bro. Is that the case? I don't think so. I don't think it has got to do with vengeance. I don't think it has got to do with intelligence. I think it's got to do with something else. Your free, no tech life hack. Um, and all it requires of you is this, that you change your posture for two minutes. But before I give it away, I want to ask you to right now do a little audit of your body and what you're doing with your body. So how many of you are sort of making yourself smaller? Maybe you're hunching, um, crossing your legs, maybe wrapping your ankles. Sometimes we hold on to our arms like this. Uh, sometimes we uh, spread out. <laughs> I see you. Um, so I want you to pay attention to what you're doing right now. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. And I'm hoping that if you sort of learn to tweak this a little bit, it could significantly change the way your life unfolds. Um, 
So we're really fascinated with body language, and we're particularly interested in other people's body language. You know, we're interested in, like, you know, um, a uh, uh, an awkward interaction, or a smile, or a contemptuous glance, or maybe a, a very awkward wink, um, or maybe even something like a handshake. Here they are arriving at number ten, and. Uh... Look at this lucky policeman gets to shake hands with the President of the United States. Oh, and here comes the Prime Minister of the... No. <laughs> so, um, a handshake or the lack of a handshake can have us talking for weeks and weeks and weeks, even the BBC and the New York Times. So, so obviously, when we think about nonverbal behavior or body language, but we call it nonverbals as social scientists, it's language. So we think about communication. When we think about communication, we think about interactions. So what is your body language communicating to me? What's mine communicating to you? And there's a lot of reason to, be to, to believe that this is, this is a valid way to look at this. So social scientists have spent a lot of time looking at the effects of, of our body language or other people's body language on judgments. And we make sweeping judgments and inf inferences from body language. And those judgments can predict really meaningful life outcomes like who we hire or promote, um, who we ask out on a date. For example, uh, uh, Nalini Ambadi, a researcher at Tufts University, shows that when people watch 30-minute, 30-second uh, soundless clips of real physician-patient interactions, their judgments of the physician's niceness predict whether or not that physician will be sued. So it doesn't have to do so much with whether or not that physician was incompetent, but do we like that person and how they interacted. Um, even more dramatic, Alex Todorov at Princeton has shown us that um, judgments of political candidates' faces in just one second predict 70% of U.S. Senate and gubernatorial race outcomes. And even, let's go digital, emoticons used well in online negotiations can lead you to claim more value from that negotiation. If you use them poorly, bad idea. In 2009, a man, a journalist, by the name Rob Walker, wanted to find out is, is storytelling really the most powerful tool of all? And in order to do this, he went on his computer and he bought 200 objects from eBay. And the average price of the objects were about $1. He then called 200 authors and he asked them, hey, would you like to be part of the significant object study? Which means that I would like to write a story to one of the objects. And 200 authors said yes. So there he had 200 objects, he had 200 stories, and I assume that it was with nail-biting anticipation that he went on eBay again with all the 200 objects. Would there be a difference? Would there be a change? Do you think there was a change? One of the objects was this, this beautiful horse's head. There we go. The beautiful horse's head. Now this beautiful horse's head was bought for 99 cents and was sold when the story was added for $62.95. That is a slight increase of 6,395%. So was this a one-off situation? Not really, because he bought the 200 objects for a total of $129, selling them for $8,000. Now that's insane. But you know what's even more intellectually challenging to understand is how can you and I go to the movies and pay good money to watch movies like James Bond, who are absolutely unrealistic. And we sit there, we enjoy the movie, and some of us, we really enjoy the movie. And we leave the theatre going like, God, what a man! <laughs> I would like to be more like him, I'd like to walk like him, I'd like to talk like him. I like Bond. 
wonder how I could be more like Bond. And then this weird revelation hits you like from nowhere and you come up with a brilliant idea to walk to a watchmaker shop. And wow, it just happens to be an Omega watch in that shop that resembles the one that Bond was wearing in the movie. And you pay $10,000 to put that watch on your wrist and you leave that store feeling more like Bond. How is that possible?